right, well, I wanna welcome everybody gathered across all of our locations and those of you joining us online. Today, we are kicking off a new series of messages called Red Letter Talks. And so if you have a Bible, go ahead and find John chapter 14. John chapter 14 is where we're gonna kick this off. It's the passage we're gonna unpack together today. You know, here recently I was reading about um, something called um, dumb laws that are still on the books in various states around the country. Apparently, kind of where this kind of traces its origins is that at one point in time, there were these laws that were made because of some series of events at the time, but then they were kind of forgotten about and times changed, but the laws stayed on the books. And honestly, I think there are so many of these. Some of these are based in truth. And honestly, I think some of these are myth. You'll probably be able to see that as I kind of walk through this. Uh, for example, in Missouri, which is the state I'm from, it's illegal to have a garage sale that lasts more than three days. And, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe this one is true because growing up in Missouri, there just wasn't a lot to do. So I could see how, so they just keep the garage sale going, right? We don't have a lot to do. Um, in uh, the state of um, Louisiana, apparently it's illegal to wrestle a bear. So that's good to know. Um, not as an individual, you can't tag team it, not even as a group, like, not even if you think you could take the bear. It's illegal to do that. Um, I think this one's probably a myth, but it's, apparently it's illegal to eat an orange in a bathtub in California, which is really unfortunate because I like some citrus refreshment while bathing, but <laughs> that's illegal. Um, and then our own state, we can be proud of this one. Uh, you can't sniff glue with the intent to get high in Indiana. <laughs> It's that intent to get high part. I think actually the, the way that it reads is you're not allowed to sniff toxic vapors of any kind, including glue, with, in the quote, the intent to cause a condition of intoxication, euphoria, excitement, exhilaration, stupefaction, or the dulling of senses. So I guess for any other reason it's okay, but <laughs> doing it to do that, it's illegal. Now, um, you know, we can kind of laugh at that because those are dumb. You know, those are just dumb laws. I don't know about you, but I am totally okay with rules just as long as they make sense. But if they don't make sense, that's an invitation to break them. And I married somebody who follows all the rules, so that is fun. <laughs> and so maybe for you, maybe you're here today or maybe somebody that you know, maybe that's the way that you kind of view the Bible or the Christian faith. It's sort of gotten resorted to a bunch of rules or laws that in your mind don't really make a whole lot of sense, or maybe at one time they made sense, but times have changed. I mean, 2,000 years ago, that's a really long time. And so the idea of trying to know all the rules and live by the rules is exhausting, and it's just an invitation to, to feel like you don't measure up or that you fail, and so you kind of equate what Jesus has come to offer as more additional rules and you don't really want to live by that. So you've kind of rejected all of it or maybe you keep one foot in and one foot out. And if that would be your interpretation of what it is that Jesus is offering, that would be um, unfortunate because that is a misrepresentation. That's a misunderstanding. He's not come to add more rules. In fact, in Galatians 5 verse 1, it says it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Amen. Jesus would even say this one time, he'd go, hey, my yoke is easy and my burden is, is light. And so if that's the case, well, what is it that Jesus has really come to offer? And what is it that maybe is a misunderstanding or a misrepresentation? And so today we're gonna jump into this thing called Red Letter Talks. It's gonna lead us up through Easter. And what we're doing is we're just gonna look at some of the things that Jesus said. We're gonna go, as the phrase goes, straight to the horse's mouth to hear what it is that Jesus is truly offering and maybe what is a myth or maybe what is a misrepresentation. In your Bible, whether you have a paper Bible or an electronic one, you, you likely have a, a section of scripture that is written in red. Mostly it's found in the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are the biographies of Jesus' life. And then there's some red letters in the very last book of the Bible, Revelation. And what that is, is these are not words about Jesus. It's not describing what Jesus said and did. These are the very words of Jesus. And so we just want to take some time leading up to Easter to just sit and kind of marinate in his words. He says a lot and what he says is really deep and it's impactful. One of the things that you'll notice if you're taking down a few notes 
as you read the red letters, in fact, I would encourage you throughout this series just to spend some time in the red letters. And you'll notice a couple of things. Number one, just notice how many questions Jesus asks. He asks a lot of questions, which is kind of interesting. I mean, there's a couple of things that we could say here. Number one, if you really want to become a better conversationalist, learn to ask more and better questions. If you want to grow in emotional intelligence, ask better questions. That's kind of a lost art for many of us. And Jesus was always asking questions. Here's the other thing that kind of blows my mind. He already knows everything. Like he's, he's, he's God in the flesh, and yet he still asks so many questions. So second thing that you'll notice as you read the red letters is just the number of invitations he extends. He is always inviting us to things. He's always inviting us to check things out. He's always inviting us to some sort of action or experience because faith cannot be enacted without movement. So he's always inviting us to something. Another thing that I notice is that Jesus resists the urge to try to figure everything out for us. Like he's okay with a little bit of tension. He's okay with us to kind of wrestle with some concepts. He's okay to let a rich young ruler walk away. Another thing that I notice is just how many times Jesus will say things either to settle unsettled hearts or to unsettle overly confident hearts. He just knows what it is we need to hear. And so today we're going to look at something that Jesus says in John chapter 14. I want to kind of set this up before we're just going to kind of go straight through the text and I'll read what Jesus says and then try to offer some explanation to it. But in this passage, Jesus, what he's doing here is he's saying goodbye to his disciples. So he had 12 disciples and they've been following him around for about three years. Most of them were 10, 15 years younger than him. They, they had left everything to follow Jesus. They'd left homes and families and friends and careers. They, they put all the chips in on the table to, to follow Jesus. And they thought they'd be with him for the rest of their lives. They, he keeps talking about this kingdom. And they're like, well, okay, any day now, you're just going to kind of usher in this kingdom. And we're going to be with you to lead out in this kingdom. But Jesus is announcing to them in this passage some news that they really didn't want to hear. He's been trying to communicate this to them. It just hasn't been getting through. But he's basically saying goodbye in this passage. Because the next day, he's going to be arrested and crucified. He's, he's going away. And so John 14 is a passage for anybody who has ever felt like things are changing. It's a passage for anybody who's ever felt lonely or rejected um, or defeated. But one of the things that we're going to notice here is that Jesus also is going to invite us into something as well, a significant life purpose. It's all in this passage. And so let's start in, in verse one. Jesus says to his disciples, and therefore he says to you and me today, these really powerful words, don't let your hearts be troubled. Anybody troubled by anything today? And Jesus, here's his response to this. He's, he's acknowledging the trouble, but then he's saying, hey, don't let your hearts be troubled. Actually, he's going to say something really similar two chapters later in John 16. He's going to say, in this world, you will have trouble. Now, I think one of the things that we got to really, first of all, maybe kind of circle, highlight, underline is we got to understand, okay, what does he mean by trouble? Because obviously there's a lot of things that could get included or packed into that word. And there's a lot of Greek words that are used for this word trouble. Uh, so this could mean like, don't let your hearts be frustrated. Don't, be, don't let your hearts be annoyed. Like little, little things that maybe trouble you throughout the day. You, you know the ones like, you know. Um, but the word that he uses here for trouble is, is, is a different Greek word. So this isn't like the idea of like, hey, don't let your hearts be, you know, troubled by the fact that you've got an unexpected bill or you got a speeding ticket or you went to Meyer and you're in a rush and you try to decide which line you're going to step into. You've all done this. You, you look at the people in the line and you just size them up. You stereotype really is what you do to say, well, these people look fast and those people look slow. So I'm going into this one and almost every time they let you down. <laughs> like you guys were the fast ones, but now you're going slow and it's, 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 trouble. These are little things that just kind of add up. But that's not the Greek word that Jesus uses. The, the word that he uses here is a word that connotates the highest levels of pain and anxiety. 
It's the same word that John uses a few chapters earlier in chapter 11 to describe how Jesus felt when his good friend Lazarus died and it prompted him to weep. It's the same word that's used in chapter 13 to describe how Jesus felt when another one of his disciples, Judas, betrayed him. So this is a word that carries significant emotional weight. So here's another way of saying what Jesus just said. Don't let your hearts be kept up at night feeling overwhelmed by uncertainty. Any of you ever been there? Don't let your hearts be broken into pieces when the person that you loved walks away. Don't let your hearts be ripped into shreds when the phone rings in the middle of the night with the devastating news. Don't let your hearts be Spartan kicked into a bottomless pit from the de de devastating diagnosis. Now, I don't know how you feel about any of that. I'm kind of like, okay, great. <laughs> don't let my heart, how do you do that exactly? Don't let my heart be troubled. I, I don't want my heart to be troubled. I want my heart to be at peace. I don't want to fall asleep at night thinking about the contingency plans for a future I thought was pretty well mapped out. How do I do that, Jesus? And I'm just guessing the disciples are probably thinking a lot like what maybe some of us are thinking today. is okay, well, I don't want my heart to be troubled. You're telling me not for my heart to be troubled. So why don't you change my circumstances so my heart won't be troubled? Solve my problems. And then I won't be troubled by that. Make things better. Promise me that everything's going to be okay and that the road ahead is going to get a lot easier. So just imagine me, with me, if you would, like if, if I'm saying to you, hey, don't let your hearts be troubled, what do you think you might be tempted to say next? Don't, don't let your hearts be troubled. Everything's going to be okay. Isn't that what we say to our kids? Hey, don't let your hearts be troubled. I think things are going to get better. The worst is behind us. The best is yet to come. That's not what Jesus says, though. Look, at, look back at the passage. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Here's what he says. Trust in God. And trust also in me. What's he doing? He's saying in the midst of the trouble, you've got to pay attention to where your focus is. It, it kind of reminds me of when Peter walks on water and... He's actually doing it. That's amazing. He's actually walking on water with Jesus. And then he starts to sink. When does he start to sink? When he takes his eyes off Jesus and looks at the trouble. Amen. And so this is really kind of a question for, for many of us that like the trouble is not going away. Like on this side of eternity, there's going to be more trouble that's going to come. There always is. In fact, it might even to you feel like the trouble is beginning to mount. And hold on to that thought for a minute because we're actually going to see how when trouble mounts, that actually more opportunities and more of the Holy Spirit's power is made available to us. But in the midst of trouble, we need to ask ourselves, okay, this actually is an opportunity for me to put my trust in who or what I say I put my trust. Because when you go through, like, you can tell me all day, like, what you worship, and you can tell me all day, and I can tell you all day, like, where my confidence lies. But really, the test of that is when I go through trouble. When I go through trouble, it actually reveals what I've been worshiping all along. When I go through trouble, it actually reveals where my, my weight has been rested upon. I'll never forget, in one of my early ministries, um, Lindsay and I were living in California and there was a young couple in our church that uh, got pregnant. They were all excited and it was their first child. And, and uh, this, this um, baby was born with a birth defect and the doctors said that you'll, you'll probably have about a year with her. It was devastating news. And, the, and she, this baby looked healthy, but she wasn't gonna live past a year. And I remember having them over to our house and just loving on them. And um, I'll never forget about six months uh, into this child's life, uh, she passed away. And I'll never forget getting that phone call on that Saturday morning, they lived in our neighborhood. And she called me and she said, Pastor, can you please come over? She, she passed away in the middle of the night. And I remember walking into that living room. I mean, what do you say? <laughs> And sitting down next to this young mom on the couch as she's holding this lifeless baby. And I'll never forget, she was holding her. And she, you could tell she'd been weeping. She had some tears streaming down her cheeks. But there was this sense of resolve to her. And as I sat down, she, she was just looking straight ahead. And she, she said these words that I've never forgotten. She said, 
Well, I guess this is when I find out if I really believe what I say I believe. It's easy to say that we're putting our trust in God when things are relatively trouble-free. What do you do when the trouble comes? And Jesus invites us in this moment. He doesn't promise us a trouble-free life, but he does invite his accessibility and his power in the midst of the trouble that we face. And so you can begin, like, I mean, either way, whether you believe in God or not, trouble's going to come. So, so you can begin to look at this as an opportunity to say, I can go through trouble without him or I can go through trouble with him. And Jesus says, trust me, Tr trust me. Well, why should we trust him? Well, verse two, he gives us a pretty good reason why. He says, there is more than enough room in my father's home. I love that. God's got a lot of square footage. And he says, if this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Now, I love how he rolls this out. This is a clear reference to heaven, but I love how he describes it. And it really, I mean, we got to kind of do a little bit of theological work here to understand what, what he's you know, talking about. Is that if you go back to the garden of Adam and Eve, with Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve are at home with God in the garden. And they became homeless when they chose rebellion and sin. And deep down inside, all of us know that we are homeless. Sin has made us homeless. And now Jesus says, I am remaking that home. I am preparing a place for you. So, you know, I don't know if you've ever thought this, like, well, you know, what's Jesus doing right now? Well, Jesus says right here in the passage, he is a general contractor. He is preparing a place for us. Well, wow, man, when's it going to be ready? I don't know if any of you have ever built a house. Every time I ask my general contractor, what was the answer? Eh, about two weeks. About two weeks. Like just, is that just, just a little bit longer. Just a, what, how much longer? I don't know. When it's ready. Man, it must be someplace. As a mind-blowing thought. Right now, Jesus is preparing a place for you. You've got a home. You are being expected. Not only you, but everybody that you know, like people in your neighborhood, people that you work with. We gotta begin to think about it that way, that Jesus is preparing a place. I love what it says in 1 Peter, that he is not slow in keeping his promises, he's patient. He's wanting everybody to come to know him. Because why? Because he's preparing a place for them. And in verse four, he says, you know the way to where I'm going. And man, I love Thomas's response because it's so honest. He goes, no, we don't know, Lord. We have no idea where you are going. So how can we know the way? I love that. Thomas is so honest. Some of us, have you ever been talking to somebody and they're talking about something, you have no idea what they're talking about, but you don't want to let them know that. So you just kind of nod your head like, yeah. <laughs> Thomas didn't do that. Thomas is like, no, wait a second. Like, Jesus, we don't know what you're talking about. Like, we don't know the way to where you're going. You're going to need, we're going to need to Apple Maps this thing because we are 12 men we're just going to get lost. We're going to drive around in circles for a few hours before anybody admits it. Jesus, we need you to be more clear. And so Jesus is, verse 6, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Oh, man. Those words will get you canceled today. Those words will incite the comments on social media because everybody's okay with whatever it is you choose to believe just as long as that's your truth, but I have my truth. But the minute you say this is the only way, oh man. So what's Jesus mean by this? Does Jesus mean that every other faith system is inferior to him? Well, we could say that, but I think what Jesus is primarily driving at is not that every other faith system is inferior. It's that every other faith system is irrelevant. It's irrelevant to save in the sense that you have a debt that needs to be paid. He's the only one who's paid the debt. Amen. Every other faith system. And by the way, even, even a system of faith that says, I don't believe in anything, that's still a system of faith because you can't prove that. So every, you, there's no system of faith. Like even if you're just like, I'm just kind of going to do me and just try to be as good of a person as I can. That's still faith. Because I would even say, well, ultimately, where do you think this thing is leading and how much good justifies you? It, honestly, it's a guess. And every other religion and system of belief says, well, just do enough of good things and then you'll be good. But how much good gets you in? And Jesus is extremely clear by saying, no, here's the debt that needs to be paid. Let me pay the bill. I'm the only one 
who can do this. Now, C.S. Lewis unpacks this argument beautifully when he talks about this. And he, he will say, you know, I've heard some people complain that if Jesus was God as well as man, then his sufferings and death lose all value in their eyes because it must have been so easy for him to die on a cross. <laughs> and Lewis says, if I'm a drowning in a rapid river and a man who still has one foot on the bank gives me a hand which saves my life, should I look back at him between gasps and say, no, it's not fair. You have an advantage. You're keeping one foot on the bank. And then he says, that advantage, call it unfair if you like, is the only reason why he can be of any use to me. To what will you look for help if you will not look to that which is stronger than yourself? Jesus is on the way, the truth, and the life. Let me pay the bill. Let me reconcile you back to God. And then he finishes out this passage with an invitation. If you had really known me, you would know who my father is. And from now on, you do know him and you have seen him. So this is why we, if, you, if you're kind of new to our church, you're like, why do you guys keep talking about Jesus so much? That's why. Is that if you've seen Jesus, you've seen God. You want to know what God is like? Look at what Jesus is like. You want to know what God would say to hurting people like a tax collector in a tree and an adulterous woman at a well? Then look at what Jesus would say to them. Jesus is God in the flesh. And if you've been with Jesus, you've been with God. In verse 8, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. And Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip? And yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe because of the work that you have seen me do. That's a reference to miracles. Now verse 12. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me, that's you all, will do the same works I have done. And if that's not astounding enough, he, he, it gets better. And even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. That is astounding. And that per passage has always kind of perplexed me a bit because I'm like, what in the world is Jesus talking about? Is he saying that we're going to do miracles like he did and even greater miracles? I mean, it could be a reference to that. I, I don't know that that's fully what he's driving down on. I don't think that Jesus is saying that we'll all of a sudden have like these, you know, superpowers if we believe in him, because I certainly don't feel that way. What does he mean? This is a reference. What one commentator puts it this way. When Jesus says greater works, this is a reference to more people coming to know him. This is the idea of... Uh, the, the technical word for this would be conversions, that more and more people would come. And if you notice back in the passage, he, he says that the Father is doing a work through him. So he goes, God wants to do a work in you and God wants to do a work through you. And you're gonna even be a part of witnessing even greater works than I have done. So uh, right after Jesus ascends into heaven, we have something called the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a history of the um, beginnings of the big C church. And one of the things that you'll find is that there was this, this, there were more conversions in the book of Acts than there were during Jesus' earthly ministry. Think about that for a minute. So on the day of Pentecost alone, more people became believers that day than the entire three-year ministry of Jesus' earthly life. In Acts chapter 2, Peter stands up and gives a much shorter sermon than Jesus gave on the Sermon on the Mount. And 3,000 people were pierced to the heart and gave their lives to Christ that day. Another 5,000 people a couple of chapters later. That was a literal fulfillment of what Jesus is saying in our passage today in John 14. You'll do even greater things than these. Because nowhere in Jesus' earthly ministry do we see 3,000 people responding to him in one day. And so today we got to ask ourselves, um, okay, a couple things. Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Seems to me like there's more things to be troubled by now than ever. Would you not agree with that? And yet he says, in the midst of all the trouble, keep your eyes fixed on me. And as you do... You will be a part of God doing a work in you so that God might do a work through you and you're going to experience even greater things than these. 
So did you know that there have been more people who have become Christians in the last 120 years than the previous 1,500 years combined? Primarily through technology and travel. And so the gospel has begun to spread. We're beginning to see that God is up to something big and he's on the the move. And right now we can, when we look at all of the trouble in the world, there's a number of responses that we could give to all that trouble. Right now, a fearful world needs a fearless church. An angry world needs a peace-filled church. A panicked world needs a thoughtful church. A timid world needs a courageous church. And instead of trying to wish for a trouble-free life, recognize that the trouble is actually an invitation to step into his power. And that can only be done when you spend significant amounts of time with Jesus. And so I just have to say, as we go into the week and as the year continues to unfold, there's gonna be trouble that's gonna come. And when you experience trouble, uh, I, I want to step into this with you. Instead of trying to pray that God would remove the trouble, I want to pray that God would empower me by his spirit. That, that we would invite his spirit to come. Because it's usually in the moments of the most significant trouble that we see God flexing the most. And what if there could just be more and more people come to know Jesus by way of our faith and our courage and With the amount of trouble comes the amount of the availability of his Holy Spirit. And so I just have to tell you, uh, I see trouble on the horizon. Um, The end of this year, we're we're bound to face one of the most contentious, divisive presidential elections of our lifetime. This is going to be a lot of fun. And this is where already we have to, I kind of feel like, how many of you ever go to uh, Colorado and you go whitewater rafting and you get in one of those boats and there's, the river guide in the back, and he's trying to get you safely through the rapids. Yeah. That's kind of how I feel. Like our church, our church is a raft, and I see the rapids coming up in November. And I just kind of feel like I just need to keep reminding us, not, not that we need to be passive around this, not that we don't need to be passionate or involved or prayerful. We need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. I saw this picture right after the Super Bowl. I mean, you probably saw it. Everybody was talking about it. Of, you know, Kelsey yelling at his coach and, you know. And then somebody said, um, that coach is every pastor during the presidential election. And I just had to laugh. I was just like, yeah, that's right. And I'm like, man, you know, thinking about all this, like I'm already thinking about, you know, trying to lead through COVID, you know, it's like I'm twitching, you know, I'm like I'm in PTSD just knowing this is coming. And yet at the same time, I recognize that there could be like a real opportunity for us to like be the church in the midst of all the division, the anger and the frustration that we know that we're going to experience as a church. We, we don't want to miss this opportunity. I just think that God's doing something right now. So, so I want to show you this um, graphic up on the screen behind me. This is a timeline of four of the last great awakenings that we've experienced, going all the way back to 1730. So I want you to see the pattern here. The the first great awakening uh, kicked off in 1730. God used a couple of young men named Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield to kick that off. And then it ended in 1740. 50 years later, the second one started in 1790, led by Charles Finney. It ended in 1850. 50 years later, the third one started in 1900 with a young buck by the name of Dwight Moody. It ended in 1910. 50 years later, God used another guy, maybe you've heard of him, Billy Graham, to kick off another great awakening. It ended in 1975. And then um, the 50-year mark from that is 2025. Now, here's what I'm, I'm not saying. I'm not like saying that I'm not prophesying like another great awakening or anything like that. I am saying, isn't it kind of an interesting coincidence that the last four great awakenings going all the way back to 1730 were in 50 year increments and that if God continues to do what he's done in the last several hundred years then that means that quite possibly we we could be in for another one right after this election if our eyes stay fixed on him I just get the sense that God wants to do something I think that COVID, like the pandemic, was God kind of 
clearing the deck a little bit, kind of bringing some things to the surface that he needed to deal with, with his church, his bride, to get us ready for what he might do. I mean, Jesus says it straight up in this passage. And I get a sense that God is at work even in our church. I don't know how many of you were at worship night, Thursday night, but um, it was unreal. I need to tell you that... um, That in my 23 years of full-time ministry, I don't know that I've ever experienced a moment that powerful. And I, I'm not, I don't think I'm overstating that. I would say the first time we ever did spontaneous baptisms where we baptized over 250 people, it was right up there. And then Thursday night. And uh, coming into that night, I didn't really know what to expect. I'd been traveling, actually. I'd just gotten in, back in town, and I really wasn't a part of the planning of the night. And... Uh, and so I come in, and, as, and I didn't even really fully know what I was going to say. I knew I had a part of the worship night where they wanted me to come up here and say something, but I didn't really know what I was going to say. That will instill a lot of confidence in you, I'm sure. And, um, <laughs> and so I'm sitting there, and Landon kind of let us out with God, you know, talking to the prophet Isaiah in chapter 6. And, and uh, I'm looking around the room, and I'm just seeing all these young people worshiping their faces off. And it was as if God began to kind of um, stir in me. And it was just like, um, Aaron, um, bless them, commission them, call them out. And I didn't know what all that was gonna look like. My, my wife told me later, we went on a date Friday night. She was asking me how I thought about worship night. And she goes, I could see that your gears were moving. And I was just like trying to formulate all this. I didn't know how I was gonna go. And when I stepped up on this stage, it felt like I was riding a lightning bolt And um, I just called out and asked anybody under the age of 30 if they felt like Isaiah, God, here am I, send me, send me to just come. I thought maybe 10 or 15 might respond. It was several hundred just coming. It felt like there were so many people coming forward that I was like, who's going to be left in the seats when this is all done? Because they all came down and filled the front, filled the aisles. And it was a powerful, powerful moment in which I felt like the ground shifted under our feet, that God wants to do something through this next generation and we want to be ready for it. Guys, can I just tell you, I was with a group of pastors this last week from all over the country and we just kind of went through, it was just kind of us kind of uh, encouraging each other and we said, hey, how many of you are experiencing like unprecedented numerical growth right now? 80, 90% of the hands went up in the room. I've been meeting with groups of pastors for 20 years. I've never seen that. We were like, how many of you have baptized more people in 2023 than you've ever baptized? 80, 90% of the hands went up in the room. How many of you got more people in groups than ever? I was like, this is amazing. What? Because it's the big C church and God is doing something significant across the land. I just want you to see this, even in our own church, just since uh, COVID, in 2021, we started regathering physically after the pandemic, just kind of see just the numerical growth. By the way, we're not just about the numbers. I don't think numbers are bad. Numbers represent changed lives. There's a whole book in the Bible called Numbers. But we don't focus on growth. Yeah, some of you just, yeah. (laughs) We don't just focus on growth for growth's sake. No, uh, growth comes by abiding. And when you abide, he brings the increase. We're just trying to stay connected to him. Healthy things grow. We can see the next one, the number of baptisms just off the charts last year, like almost double last year where we had been in previous years. We, uh, we're kind of in our fourth session of Rooted. And so you can kind of see Rooted numbers. The only reason why it dipped in the third session is because we were in Awaken and we did Awaken groups instead of Rooted. But it's jumped right back up with Rooted. Uh, we've seen the number of first-time given, givers have just uh, skyrocketed uh, this, this last year, people buying in. And then uh, the number of YouTube subscribers. So just God is continuing to get this word out. I just show you all that to just show that he's doing something. He's stirring something up and I don't want to miss it. I, I, I want to, in the midst of the trouble, I want to fix my eyes upon him and I want to take Jesus at his red letter words that we'll do the same things he did, even greater things than these. And that is in reference to us partnering with the Holy Spirit to see lives change for all of eternity. I wanna be a part of it. And I hope you do too. And when the trouble comes, and when the division comes, we can get caught up in the rage of culture or we can stand on solid ground and point people to the hope and the help that comes in and through Jesus Christ. 
And so as we kick off this series and as we get closer and closer to the election this fall, man, we've got to stay close to Jesus. And so let's begin by doing that today, by taking communion together as a church family across all of our locations. I just invite you to this. If you're online, grab something that you can do communion with and join us in this. Let's just do communion together. First of all, just by taking the bread, which is representative of Jesus' body that he gave for us on a cross. And the juice, which represents his blood that covers and cleanses and atones for our sin. Father, thank you for being the way and the truth and the life. And we know that trouble's coming. We cannot live a trouble-free life as much as we try, but you've offered us something so much better than trouble-free. You've offered us solid ground. So keep our eyes firmly fixed upon you. We take you at your red letter words that as the trouble increases, so do the opportunities for the power of your Holy Spirit to work in us and through us to see more and more lives changed for all of eternity. God, we don't wanna miss the wave that it appears that you're sending. So would you keep us close to you? We give you all the glory for the increase. And it makes sense that the numbers would go up because the numbers of people going through pain and hurt are going up and they need you now more than ever. And so we wanna be ready. God, thank you that you use people like us to make a difference for all of eternity. God, here we are, here I am, send me. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody says in agreement.